Good morning, everyone. Health experts say the COVID-19 pandemic has created a global mental health crisis with a 25% rise in anxiety and depressive disorders in the first year of the outbreak. Researchers in Britain have released a list of ways to boost your well-being. Ian Lee reports from London. It's been a tough couple of years, from coping with a pandemic to rising inflation. Mental health getting a lot more difficult to deal with these last few mm. years, especially like after having to isolate and stuff. If you find yourself struggling, experts say you're not alone. The stats are similar in the U.S. and the U.K., about one in six people every week um, experiencing diagnosable levels of um, mental illness. Britain's Mental Health Foundation says the first step is breaking the taboo around getting help. The main stigma is that um, it's your fault if you're struggling. How can someone recognize that they need help? Are there aspects of our lives that are suffering? Um, sleep is quite often the first one. And any changes in behavior, uh, motivation at work, um, being invested in the relationships that we have. The foundation studied the best ways to deal with problems like anxiety and depression, offering 11 tips to boost mental health, including connecting with nature, exercising, talking to someone, getting more sleep, not using alcohol and drugs to cope, and managing money and debt. For me, exercise is a big one, sort of yeah, running and, and um, eating healthily. I'd certainly agree from get, get more from your sleep, because if you don't get a decent sleep, that can really affect you. Experts also stress it's important for parents to listen to their kids from an early age. There's something about our societies that demonizes negative emotions. You know, we don't want sadness, we don't want anger, we don't want stress. But these are all valuable signs that something is going on. Recognizing the signs so you can better look after yourself and those around you. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. Some other tips experts say could improve your mental health include being kind, open-minded to new experiences, and planning things to look forward to. Well, we know the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on the mental health of many of us, especially teenagers. Now some new research shows that children who had their sports seasons canceled suffered significantly during that time. Nichelle Medina has more from California. One, two. Henry Weinpel is sharpening his blocking skills for the big game. The physical aspect of it and the skill involved, it's all, it's all just really fun. Yeah. And he does not take his time on the field for granted. The 17-year-old, like many teens, took a big hit when the pandemic took down sports. It was uh, really disappointing. I couldn't spend time with my friends as much as I used to. It was really difficult to stay in physical shape. I just had to keep encouraging him to to focus on the future. New research from the American Academy of Pediatrics conference shows when sports were sidelined, teen athletes reported high levels of anxiety and depression and low levels of physical activity and quality of life. This study was really kind of against the backdrop of the existing mental health epidemic that we've been seeing in adolescents. Thousands of teens nationwide filled out surveys in May 2020 after sports were canceled and then one year later when sports returned. Dramatic improvements in physical activity and quality of life and considerable improvements in anxiety and depression. Unfortunately, we haven't quite gotten back to where we were before. And so continuing to prioritize mental health in adolescents and adolescent athletes is going to be a really important priority for years to come. Henry is working harder than ever. The pandemic really got me to realize how important sports were, and it makes me enjoy it that much more. He comes home every day drenched in dirt and sweat and with a big smile on his face. And I say, how was practice? He said, it was awesome. Happy to be back with his team, which remains undefeated. Nichelle Medina, CBS News, San Marcos, California. Researchers say they're also seeing worsening mental health for teenager, teenage athletes that were not able to get back to sports since the cancellations around COVID. All right, when we come back, utensils can you that you can eat. We'll show you next time this morning. The latest trend in saving the planet is a tasty one worldwide. Companies are now making our straws, cups, and even our utensils, utensils edible. Naomi Ruckham shows us some of the more delicious ways to go green. For catering business, Bartleby and Sage, their famous mac and cheese is always a hit. What makes the dish so special? It's served on a spoon you can eat. So we're talking mac and cheese with five cheeses on a cheese flavored spoon. Yes, so you kind of have to love cheese. 
I do. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Boston area company Edibles by Jack makes the spoons, which come in 18 flavors from savory to sweet. People are choosing these products because the client themselves wants something sustainable, wants something fun that elevates their menu. And the caterers believe they serve up a double dose of delicious and practical. We were an early adapter because we just thought that was a great way to serve the food and you can also eat the spoon and then your waiters don't have to go around picking up the dirty spoons. Other brands around the world are launching their own innovative ways to bite the utensil that feeds you. These edible straws from Sorbos are completely biodegradable and last in cold drinks for up to 40 minutes. The water is definitely still water, but the have little aftertaste of the strawberry, it's like candy. Italian coffee maker Lavazza has made an espresso treat that comes in an edible cookie cup. And a company called Incredible Eats sells spoons and forks with flavors like chocolate, vanilla, oregano chili, and black pepper. Not bad. Like a cracker. You'll have to fork out extra cash for an edible utensil, priced from 25 cents each to more than a dollar. Compare that to standard plastic ware, which costs as little as four cents a piece. Is it something you would pay extra for? Mmm, maybe, yeah. And while an edible spoon may not replace your plastic one just yet, the hope is to take a small bite out of climate change. Naomi Ruckham, CBS News. According to the latest data from the Environmental Protection Agency, landfills took in 27 million tons of plastic in 2018. All right, water is California's most precious commodity these days as the state endures one of its worst droughts in recorded history. State officials say more than 1,200 wells have run dry this year, a nearly 50% increase over the same period last year. Now an Australian company has tapped into an innovative solution to the crisis by growing water that is suitable for drinking, agriculture, and just about any other use. Daniel Bacchus explains from Los Angeles. California's water crisis is most severe in the San Joaquin Valley, the country's most productive agricultural region. This year's rain and snowmelt wasn't enough to replenish already depleted groundwater supplies, and wells are being pumped dry. But now, an Australian company says it has tapped into a new and possibly endless well of clean, fresh water that's available virtually anywhere on Earth. We like to say that in simple terms, we grow water. Terry Paul is the co-founder and CEO of Botanical Water Technologies. Plants, fruit and vegetables, sugarcane, are often 95% water. So if we can find a water, to, a way to harvest that water that naturally occurs in plants, then we've found a new source of water. BWT recently partnered with California's Ingomar Packing Company. Ingomar turns tons of San Joaquin Valley grown tomatoes into ketchup and tomato paste. The natural byproduct of that process is water, which until now just went down the drain. We evaporate a lot of the, the tomato uh, to create ketchup, and that evaporative condensate is what we catch, and then we run that through our purification process. That happens in this self-contained unit, which fits inside a shipping container. If from one factory alone, we can uh, create up to uh, 250 million gallons of water in a 90-day period. The clean water then can flow through pipelines or be trucked to municipalities, depleted reservoirs, farms, industry, and even household water tanks. BWT is currently working to provide drinking water to several thirsty California cities. So after you turn this into this, how does it taste? The water is this water that I'm drinking. It's crystal clear. It tastes like really, really great water. Each water purification unit costs about a million dollars and can travel to wherever any crop is undergoing processing. Where we see a truck of tomatoes, it's also a truck of water. Paul says next he's taking the technology to India, where clean water is a scarce commodity. This is game changing. This is a huge invention for the world. But here in the U.S., it starts with tomatoes, a drop in the bucket that could lead to a fountain of clean water for anyone who needs it. Donya Bacchus, CBS News. Botanical Water Technologies has created a water exchange where corporations that would like to give back to their communities can purchase and gift the water. The company hopes to play a major role in alleviating the world's water problem by delivering clean and safe drinking water to 100 million of the world's most vulnerable people by 2025. Coming up, a radio station behind prison walls. A look at second chances next on Good Morning.
Welcome back. A story about second chances and finding new purpose in life. Nancy Chan visited a radio station that's become the first of its kind in the country and got to know more about the powerful stories of the people behind the mic. It is 42 past the hour. Spinning this music for you, man. 90 miles east of Denver, this Colorado radio station runs like any other. I'm your host, Benny Hill, and I've got a good show in store for you today. But the on-air hosts are inmates here in Lyman Correctional Facility. Testing mic one. Testing mic two. Jody Aguirre has been in prison for three decades. Where he goes and when are strictly limited. But his voice is one of a handful. So imagine the scenery as you listen to the words of this song. Now traveling far beyond the barbed wire fences. Broadcast to all of Colorado's correctional facilities and streamed online to the public, this is Inside Wire, the nation's first and only statewide prison radio system. Coming up right now, we're gonna go into a nice, soft song. What do you like most about being on a radio station? We are being something better than we've been told we've been all of our lives. Let's appreciate the now, the right here and now. Aguirre is one of 14 Absolutely. inmates selected across four prisons to DJ and produce shows on Inside Wire, which launched in March. I am your host, Joaquin Marez, and I am back once again to help you get your morning started off on the right track. Though the station broadcasts 24 seven, each episode is pre-taped and screened by staff and often ends on a note of encouragement. You are worth something and you are valuable. Absolutely. And you can maybe be on the radio one day, right? There are people who might be watching this who say, how come this is a luxury that you're able to do here? I would say to them, what would you rather have us be doing in here? Beating each other up or creating music shows and radio and helping our fellow men in here and women in here. Do you find that it also humanizes people who a lot of the world forgets about? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It shows that, that we are humans who love and care and have compassion, regret, remorse. And Aguirre says those emotions can often be painful. He was sentenced to life in prison in 1992 for charges, including murder. Driven to despair in solitary confinement 20 years ago, Aguirre says he tried to take his own life until something came over the prison's radio system. The song, Don't Give Up, by Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush came on. I don't remember what song was on before that. Don't give up. All I remember is that I heard those words, don't give up, we love you, and um, I, I just forgot everything I was doing, and uh, here I am. You know, I didn't die that day. It spoke to you. And that's what I hope to do. Is I want this radio program to save somebody's life, to, to, to lift somebody up. That connection right. is what Inside Wire general manager Ryan Conero envisioned. You can come up to full all with the uh, faster uh, after your voice or ends. You know. And he helped launch the station in. in partnership with the University of Denver's Prison Arts Initiative. The best we can do when someone, when any of us commits harm is actually work to take responsibility for that, to repair that, and then go forward. So you're trying to create a community here. Yes, there's a community at each prison, but whether or not the people there, both who work there and live there, view it or think of it as that, that's the question. And the answer has been forming here in real time. Well, up to the minute with Mr. Dean Williams, Mr. Dean Williams himself. Programming on Inside Wire includes inmates interviewing correctional officers and other prison staff. After me, please. Projection. 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 Articulation. Articulation. Inflection. Inflection. Conroe no. guides inmates on the basics of broadcasting, editing, and even using a computer many for the first time ever. It seems like it's about much more than just a radio station. It really is. It's on wire! It's on wire! 95% of people in this country who are incarcerated are gonna be returning to their communities. And so when they do that, how can we be a part of that being a productive, positive journey? 
And I think Inside Wire can be a little part of that. How much do you take into consideration victims' concerns here? We take victims' concerns very seriously. If someone is going to move from committing harm to repairing that harm, that includes that person taking accountability. And if the victim wants to engage in that dialogue, then that's how the person needs to show up. Inside Wire's name refers to Wire as a connection. Ready for some football, you know what I mean? A connection that has the power to travel 90 miles, reaching Aguirre's daughter, Amber Baca. My boys get to listen to him, my husband, and so it, it makes a sense of like we're together even though we can't be. She was just 11 years old when her father was arrested. I'm gonna take you into some cool songs right now. Now she listens first thing every Tuesday morning when his show airs. Are you proud of your dad? I'm very proud of my dad. The strength that he has and the strength that he's been able to withhold this whole time, I feel like most people would crumble under, but he just strives and gets higher and higher. And that's really important to me. Why is that? Because I love him and he deserves it. He's worked really hard at being the best person that he can be. Though he'll likely never leave prison, Aguirre is striving to be a better man than the one who first walked in. Do what I remember. I go to my cell and uh, I feel like I've accomplished something, something every day. All you have to do is be better. It's as simple as that. Nancy Chen, CBS News. All right, welcome back. You may think you know about tacos, but one man goes above and beyond. Jose Rolad is arguably this country's foremost expert. Omar Villafranca joins him for tacos. In its simplest form, the taco is a tortilla with a filling. Made from corn or flour. Filled with beef or pork or even octopus. It's humble street food and elevated fine dining fare. But it's so much more than that. It's grown to be one of the most popular foods in the world and a way to convey culture. You know, tacos are a force for good. Jose Rolat should know. He's the country's first taco editor for Texas Monthly. Much like the food he writes about, Rolat is both down to earth, he openly talks about his stutter, and highbrow. He recently won a James Beard Award for his work. You just won a very prestigious award that is usually given to people who write about white tablecloth places. There's a legitimacy to everything. There is value in talking about what people often overlook. Mm -hmm and people overlook Mexicans and Mexican food all the time, even the taco. The Puerto Rican-born Rolat didn't grow up eating the folding food, but after years in Texas, the taco's temptation inspired him to go head first into writing about the Mexican cuisine. I was looking for a way to not only tell stories that were at risk of being lost, and I wanted leave these stories for my son, because these are the stories of his people. Pero tengo, eh. Stories like those of Mexican immigrant Rodolfo Jimenez. He's a lucha libre loving former telenovela actor who brought his Guadalajara style fare to Mascara's Mexican Grill in Dallas. Ralat writes about how the beef birria taco saved Jimenez's restaurant. It increased the sales like by 300%, but not only that, now, People know the rest of the menu, and they come because they know they won't find it anywhere else. Did Instagram make the Bidia Taco famous? Absolutely. Absolutely. A little dip in there? Dip. That Insta-friendly dip into the Bidia, or stew, is a distinctly American twist. Mexicans drink it. It's not just eating a taco, it's, it's almost like a little experience, a ritual. Yeah, and I, I still prefer it the old-fashioned way, in a bowl. Revolver's Gastro Cantina. It's fancy tacos, but, but they're still traditional. Since you need multiple sources on stories, 
And since CBS was paying, look at all that food. We tried another spot on the taco trail. Everything we have here is eaten in Mexico. Octopus, duck, tongue, yes. beef tongue. What are you gonna have first? I'm gonna go for this fajita because I have ordered it several times and have been told it's been sold out. Oh, I like this, yeah. a CBS exclusive. This is excellent border food. I'm gonna try the octopus. <laughs> it, it's not supposed to be tidy and neat. It's good. It's got the spices that you wouldn't expect with octopus. The taco, the tortilla itself is fantastic. When people try a taco like this that they may not have ever tried, what does it open them up to? Hopefully it teaches them that just because something is outside of their experience, it doesn't mean that it's illegitimate. Ralat says tacos tell a story. And like stories, tacos have a beginning, a juicy middle part, and an end, meant to be enjoyed over and over again. Omar Villafranca, CBS News, Dallas. And we will be right back. All right, make sure you stay connected with us. We will love to hear from you. We will see you back here next.